Welcome to Strong Meat. Um, as always, I'm glad to come to you with this program. And um, it's a delight um, that God has given us the privilege of being able to use all this media, you know, live streaming, YouTube, Facebook, uh, to share the word of God the way we are able to do so. Um, for those of you who are watching now, you're probably wondering how what happened, but we just got a few technical issues with our internet connection, and we were unable to go live as we had expected before. But um, I know that uh, in spite of it all, you were anxious, you were eagerly waiting for this word, and um, regardless of anything the enemy will try, the word will still go out as it needs to. And um, so we've been speaking about Zoe, the God kind of life. And it's important as we talk about this, I always I try to give a little review just so that for anyone who finds that this is their, maybe the first message they're hearing in the series, they'll, they'll at least have an idea of where we're coming from. So John 10.10, 10, uh, Jesus speaks and he says, the enemy comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. But I am come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. That's what he says. And the word used for life there is zoe. Zoe therefore means full life. The definition of zoe is life to the full. And then you see he says that we have life to the full and we have it abundantly, meaning it, it's overflowing. We get this life, it is abundant, we enjoy it, and it overflows. So God wants us to have a full life and for it to overflow. But it's also important to understand, you see, it's one thing to tell people God wants you to have life. But what is God's definition of life? What's God's definition of Zoe life? That's why we are calling it the God kind of life. Because the world has its definitions of what a good life is. The world has its definitions of what happiness is. The world has its definition of what success looks like. And sometimes, because our minds have not been transformed, we can pick the world's definitions of success, the world's definitions of prosperity, and apply it to the word's definition. But the scriptures enjoin us and they tell us to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. It says, be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So how do we... We have to have our minds renewed and transformed to the standard of the word. So that when we define prosperity, when we define success, we define it according to the biblical measure rather than the worldly measure. Many are they who having taken the world's definition of prosperity, the world's definition of success, and then try to apply principles, have found themselves, of the scriptures, have found themselves frustrated. They found that they, they have, they're not getting the satisfaction they were looking for. They've not gotten the joy and the peace they were looking for because there is a corruption in what they're trying to do. This is what the enemy always does. He introduces a little yeast so that you find yourself trying to use principles of scripture but to achieve an unbiblical definition of life. And this is so critical to many believers today. And then we see John writing in 3rd John, he writes and he says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. So again, we see that there is a desire for the people of God to prosper, to be in health, even as their souls are prospering. So the one thing we understand, first of all, is that this kind of message is only for those who are already prospering in their souls. So we are talking about people who have already received Christ, who have received salvation, who have eternal life. We are talking about a people who have grown in the Lord. Because to be prospering in their soul, there are people who have confessed, but they are not yet prospering. 
in their soul because they, have not, they are not yet transformed. They are still struggling with many things. They are still at a certain place. And child of God, let me tell you, as I've studied scripture, I've come to understand something very interesting. That oftentimes, the reason people struggle when it comes to prosperity and the message of prosperity is that we give it to them too early. We give it to them at the wrong time in their life. We see something very interesting. By the time Paul begins to talk about the blessing in Hebrews, by the time Paul begins to talk about Abraham and then talk about Levi and talk about Melchizedek and talk about the tithe and talk about the blessing of Abraham and how God could only had to swear by himself because he could swear by no other. By the time he begins to talk about these things, he first begins by saying, Strong meat is for those who by reason of use have exercised themselves unto the discerning of good and evil. And then he goes on to say, therefore, putting aside the foundational principles of, you know, faith towards God, of turning away from wickedness, of baptisms, he's saying, look, the kind of people who now need to hear this kind of message are those who have gone beyond the basics. It's for the kind of people who have gone beyond, um, if you're still struggling with issues of grace and understanding grace, the grace of God, if you're still struggling with understanding sin and sin consciousness, with understanding what was done at the cross, with, if you're still struggling with the message of the cross, it will be very, you're not yet ready to hear the message that goes on about prosperity and because you will mix them up and you will stumble to your own detriment. So many a young believer has struggled because they've been given meat they are not yet ready for. And as a result of the mixed up principles, that's how we end up with many young believers struggling because they're hearing messages about seed. They're hearing messages about tithe. They're hearing messages about giving. They're hearing messages about believing God for supernatural harvests. But they are still struggling with the basics. They're still at the level of milk, but they're being given beef. They're being given bones. They're being told to chew on bones when their digestive, spiritual digestive systems are still at the milk level. And it is dangerous to such believers because what happens then, because their mind has not yet been transformed, because their thinking has not yet been aligned with the thinking of God, what the message does is appeal to their greed, appeal to their lusts, appeal to their flesh. And the interpretation thereof also becomes a fleshly interpretation. And this is the danger that has struck many. We see that Paul was particularly careful about this. He writes to one church and he says, I robbed other churches on your behalf. And the reason why he, he, he writes this to them is this is the context. He's now, now it is much later on in the growth and development of this church. And he's telling them that when he first came to them, he did not put any burden on them concerning supporting him. He did not put any load on them concerning giving. He did not tell them anything about a responsibility to tithe or to offer or to sow seed or to support men of God or to do any of those things. He did not tell them any of that stuff because they were young believers in the faith. So now he's writing to them and they are much further along in their development and he's telling them, I robbed other churches. And the reason why he's saying this is he's basically saying, I got from other churches that were more mature, that had reached this level, and I got my supply and sustenance from them so that I could make minister to you. So we see that Paul is careful not to teach certain things to people who are not yet ready for them, lest they stumble upon these things. Lest these things are too strong for them to digest and instead they end up causing them to fall. So 
He was so careful with them that he didn't teach them these things. Even when you see him writing to the Philippians, this is much later on, when he's telling them about taking up a collection for the saints in Jerusalem, this is much later on in the growth of that church. He is not teaching these things to believers who have just received God, who are just beginning to understand the message of grace, who are just beginning to understand turning away from dead works and having faith towards God. He is not even giving this message to believers who have not understood things like baptisms. They've not, because he says, putting aside even the doctrine of baptisms. So these are people who understand water baptism. They understand baptism in the Holy Ghost. They understand the baptism of fire. They have understood even the doctrine of baptisms. They are people who are filled with the Holy Spirit. They are people who have matured in Christ. And he says, now these are the kind of people that you give strong meat. In fact, you find that even John, we see that this is his third epistle when he brings this up. He's not bringing it up. In his first epistle, he's dealing with issues of grace. He's talking about confession of sin, and he's talking about how we know our sins are forgiven, and he's going on and dealing with Gnostic issues. He's, he's dealing with foundational things. He, it, it's only now, much later, that he brings this up. And this I find extremely fascinating. I find it fascinating because it shows that contrary to what people may think, these kinds of things are things that you teach to those who have already matured to a certain level. So you don't bring someone into, the, into Christ and lead them to Christ and they receive him and immediately you start teaching them the tithe and the offering and the seed. Because their hearts have not yet been transformed, because their minds are not yet aligned with the mind of Christ, one of two things will happen. Either they will get offended and think, you know, you want their money, or, and, and because they have not yet let go of certain things, they are going to think in terms of, well, the pastors want our money, or we are the ones helping the church, we are the ones supporting it, you know, or all sorts, or take offense when certain things don't, are not, as they expected, or if it's not a taking of offense, well, the second thing that's most likely to happen to someone like this is this. They are going to come in, it's going to tickle their greed. It's going to tickle their lusts. And they're going to start, and they're going to give, they're going to tithe, they're going to offer, they're going to succeed with the wrong motives. They will be like the ones James writes of and speaks of. And he says, you receive not because you ask not. And he says, and when you ask, you ask amiss that you may satisfy your own lusts. He's talking about the state of their hearts. These are people who, even when they've heard about asking, about faith, because their hearts have not been transformed, because they have not yet come to the place of being able to eat strong meat, they end up stumbling on these things because they are driven by their lusts. So I want to tell you, child of God, that first of all, contrary to what many may think, the kind of message concerning prosperity, concerning giving, concerning harvest, concerning how to work the principles of God concerning provision are for mature believers. They are not for those who have not yet superseded. In fact, many of the time, what we think is strong meat is actually foundational issues. Because when you see Paul's listing of what, of, what is, of what he considers for basics, there are things that most believers are still struggling with today. We'll give you an example here in Hebrews 6. Um, when you look at Hebrews 6, you find something interesting. His listing of what he thinks are foundational things is interesting. He says, therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity. Now, let's see what he calls elementary teaching. He says, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. 
of instructions about washings and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Don't you find it amazing that according to Paul, these are, these are basics, they are elementary teachings. Things about the resurrection of the dead is elementary teaching. Things about baptisms is elementary teachings. Things about faith towards God and repentance from dead works is elementary teaching. Even laying on of hands, he calls it elementary teaching. Now, do you see an interesting thing? That we've reversed things. That today, what is elementary teachings is what actually most people think is strong meat. And what is meant to be things that come later is what we teach people at the beginning. No wonder we find that the church is in a, is in a, a strange state. We find that believers are confused. We find believers are, and their priorities are messed up. Their value system is messed up. Their measure of success is messed up because someone started them off at the end instead of from the beginning. The things they were meant to hear at the start, they're hearing later. And yet those things are what create the foundation for the later things. And that's why when we started Strong Meat, we started from there. We started from the resurrection. We started by talking about what's going to come. We started by talking about death. We said talking about, by talking about our assurance of eternal life, what happens after death, what goes on from there. To some people that sounded like very strong meat, but it was actually laying foundations. Because foundations, we must know what the correct foundations are, what the correct things are, elementary teachings. So in reality, we're only beginning to actually get into strong meat, interestingly. For those of you who are listening, you are probably thinking, really? But we've been going for almost a year. Yes. We were laying foundational teachings. Amazingly, what we need to realize is that we are meant to start, first of all, by a transformation of our way of thinking. You're going to notice ever since I started talking about Zoe, the God kind of life, that I have barely gone into principles yet. There are those that are just waiting, eagerly, for me to start giving some principles, to start teaching some how-tos. Because they're saying, I, I need to prosper, I need to do well, I need, you know, this is what I've been waiting for. But what's even more important is to make sure the mind is set right. To make sure your attitudes are right. To ensure that your thinking about what success is, what prosperity is, is the right kind of thinking, is the God kind of thinking. Because should you get these principles without understanding the foundations, they will destroy you. Peter says this actually. Peter writes and he's talking about the writings of Paul. And he says, Paul writes in them about difficult things which the unlearned struggle with to their own destruction. Unfortunately, oftentimes, this is what has happened to many of you. The people have brought you things that are meant for later. And as a result, because you were not adequate, because the foundation was not adequately laid for you, the you get a mixture of good and bad. There's confusion in there. There's poison in the pot, so to speak. You see, I find it interesting that when Elisha is told there's poison in the pot, he puts flour. Why does he put flour? You know, it, it represents the word. Whenever there is poison in people's understanding, whenever there is corruption, we have to put in more of the word until we bring them back to the place where they ought to be. So when we begin to talk about the God kind of life, before we can even begin to delve into the principles that govern the God kind of life, 
before we can even begin to delve into what you need to do to live the God kind of life, we need to make sure you have the right definition and understanding of the God kind of life. We need to make sure your motives are aligned right. We need to make sure your passions are aligned right so that we are not feeding your lusts, but we are feeding godly passions. And this is why it's important to start all the way from the Gospels. You see that the Gospels lay the foundation for the epistles. As breakthrough, when we began this year, I set a challenge for the whole of Breakthrough, and that is that this year, all of us as Breakthrough must have read the Bible cover to cover. And we began, and we have a, a study guide that we are following. It's not really a study guide in that it tells you topics and breaks down certain things, but it, is, it just tells you today we are doing Matthew 1 and 2, tomorrow we are doing 3 and 4. It doesn't give you that kind of, you know, it's not uh, one of these... Um, Bible study tools where it, it gives you the food for yourself. No, you, you, you're still going to have to read and dig through these scriptures for yourself to learn. But one of the things you find interesting about it is this. We begin in Matthew. We begin from the beginning of the gospel. Why? Number one, because we understand that in order to properly understand salvation, you need to start from the Gospels. You need to start from what Jesus himself taught. What did Jesus teach about money? What did Jesus teach about our attitudes to money? What did Jesus teach about prosperity? What did Jesus teach about life? You'll be amazed that when you read the Gospels, even the order in which they are placed, first of all, was divine. That's why you find certain things are only dealt with much later on in the Gospels. When you read Matthew, Matthew is so practical. It's, in fact, it's only when you're getting later on that you begin to see John who deals with, with Jesus' divinity. And that's why I often used to tell people that if you begin and you start in John, you, you get confused. When a believer is fresh, I always tell them, start right from Matthew. There's a reason that order is the way it is. Because if you begin in John, you get confused. In the beginning, there was the word, and the word was with God. And you know, and the word became flesh. It begins to, it's confusing. But if you start in Matthew, you know, you, you start in things like the Beatitudes. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. It's, he, Jesus by the, through the Holy Spirit inspired even those that put together the scriptures to ensure that you get the knowledge in the right order. So you will notice something that Matthew deals a lot with attitudes of the heart, with mindsets. He talks about hunger for righteousness. He talks about our motives. He talks about, you know, good works. Remember what he told us, the elementary teachings, repentance from dead works. Matthew brings out things like Jesus br breaking down and saying, you know, on that day, I will ask, I will say, I was hungry and you, f you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I, you I was in prison and you visited me. He's dealing with repentance from dead works. He's laying the foundation in the same way, he, he talks about things like, you know, you cannot serve God and mammon. Again, he's dealing with attitudes. He talks about the rich man who, who said, I am increased, and he built his bands, and, that, and the next, uh, that very night, his life was required of him. So he is trying to ensure that our attitudes are right, our mindsets are right. Before we can even get into actual principles. Because if our attitudes are not right, we'll be in trouble. They'll tell you, and uh, when you study more, you get to discover that each of the Gospels portrays a particular aspect of Jesus. And, you know, depending on which Gospel you read, there, there's a, there, you know that 
well, there is a point where you are exposed to Jesus as a servant. Then you are exposed to Jesus, you know, as God. John does that, you know. And actually these also reflect, they reflect the same way that the, the four beasts have four faces, you know. You have the bull, you have the man, then you have the, uh, you, you, you have the, the ego and the lion. All of them have a certain aspect of Jesus they are representing. And in the same way, as you read these Gospels, there is something that is being set for you. There is foundations being laid so that your attitudes are right. Because you see, here is the thing. Money by itself can never bring you to the place of prosperity. It can't. I know for some people who are listening, you probably might even scoff at that because in your head you're thinking, if I just had a couple of million dollars, all my problems are solved. The truth of the matter is, there are people who are billionaires and have committed suicide. There are people who are multimillionaires and have committed suicide. The people who are multimillionaires are on, and are on medication for depression. I have met people who live the kind of life that many people dream of, and they are unhappy. They, they, there is an emptiness within them. They are looking for something and they can't find it. I met an amazing missionary, and this guy told an amazing story. At one point, he was one of these people who had, he had 100 cars and four planes. And I don't know how many boats and how many properties. He was so loaded, so to speak. He was so wealthy in terms of money. And yet, he was in a Las Vegas hotel room with a gun to his head, and he was about to blow his own brains out. He had been struggling with a drug problem. With all of that money, with all that most people would think this is it, he was going to blow his brains out because of depression and struggling with the drug condition. And Jesus intervened right there in that hotel room. Now, this is the interesting thing. Many years later, this man sold everything and feeds the homeless in New York City. He drives a bus and serves soup, he and his wife. In fact, all that money he finished a long time ago and now he, 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 has, he depends on partners to keep the ministry going. And yet he tells you that he has never been happier. He has never been more at peace. He has never been in a better place. He has never been more fulfilled. For a man who owned franchises all over the nation, who did, and he tells you, I found it all but to be empty. And this is the foundation we are trying to lay as we talk about the God kind of life. To first of all ensure that your mind, your thinking is aligned. It is aligned and in the right place. Because should you get this when you're still struggling with the lusts of the flesh, when your heart is still set on the things of this world, it will destroy you. you find yourself in a place where you ought not to be. And so today, I'm challenging you. you you'll find it very interesting. Even when you read um, Third John and you see how John is speaking, you see something interesting. First of all, it's, it's, I find it fascinating that he says, I wish. He doesn't say, I know. He says, I wish. If I had a friend, and let's say, if I had a friend, and uh, let's say I found them when they have, they're building their house, and then I tell him, you know, I wish you'd also get a car and, uh, and a Rolex watch. It means I'm speaking to the kind of person who I know has the capacity to buy themselves a car and a Rolex wash. 
If it was not, I would say, I wish you had money to also buy a car. But if I just say, I wish you'd get, that means it's already within their means to do so. If I, if I went to someone and I said, you know, I wish you'd get a car, eh? even as you have a house. I'm basically saying, you know what? Now that you've built a house, eh? why don't you go buy yourself a car? That means I believe it's already within their capacity to do so. They're already at a certain place that they are able to do so. So John writing and saying, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. He's saying, now that you are at the place where your soul is prospering, why don't you add this? And here is the other part that it shows me. When you say that kind of I wish to someone, one, it means it's within their power. But number two, it means that the onus is on them. So when he says, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health, he is making it clear that actually the choice and the power to do so is in their hands. So when you don't see prosperity and health, it is not because God has not availed them. When you're not seeing life or the Zoe kind of life, it is not that God has not availed it. No. If anything, it's an indication to us the onus is upon us to actually get this life. The onus is on us to actually activate this kind of life. It says, I wish. He would have said, I am praying honestly that God will give you prosperity and health. He would have said, I, I get on my knees and I pray that God makes you prosperous and gives you health. But instead he says, I wish above all things that you would prosper. That you would. Not that you shall, but you would prosper. You see, shall, should, for those, you know, you did English. You, you would know, they taught us the difference between shall and will. Will involves an exercise of your will. So, I wish above all things that you would prosper, that you would exercise your will towards prosperity, that you would exercise your will towards good health. So I would want to challenge you today and tell you that actually when you're not seeing health, it is not that God hasn't availed health to you. If you're not seeing prosperity, it's not that God has not availed it. It's that you've not exercised yourself towards it. Don't you find it interesting? James writes and he says, you receive not because you ask not. And when you ask, you ask amiss that you may satisfy it upon your lusts. So he says, basically he's telling them it has nothing to do with God. That their lack has nothing to do with God and everything to do with themselves. And he says there's two things. There's two categories of them. You have those who don't ask. Basically, you have those who don't know the principles and how to use them. Then you have those ones who, even though they know the principles and how to use them, their motives are corrupt. Their hearts are sick. Their lusts, their passions are so corrupt that God cannot give them because of the state of their heart when they pray, when they ask. Isn't this a fascinating thing? So there are some of you listening to me, and the issue is you don't even know how to activate. So there are those of you who no one has properly taught you the principles of the kingdom and how they apply to prosperity. 
But then there are those of you who, having had the principles, the problem is you have never dealt with the issues of your heart. You've not aligned your heart. You've not aligned your desires. You've not aligned your thinking with God's thinking. So when you apply the principles, you apply them amiss. And so you end up missing out. Those two things are what we will be dealing with in this program going forward. It's what, so that you come to that place where, first of all, your heart issues are dealt with, and then secondly, you are equipped with the principles. You are equipped with how to work the word to bring you to that place. And when we started, we started on the heart issues, and we are still on those. Why? Because it would be sad to give you the principles, and because the heart issues are not, are not dealt with, you ask a miss, and you still come back frustrated. It has been happening in the church for very many years. We've been teaching people about prosperity. In fact, the reason why today the, the word prosperity gospel is like a bad word in Christian circles is because we taught that gospel to a people whose hearts were still corrupt. Because we brought these principles to a people who then asked amiss, and then they turned back around and say, the prosperity gospel is terrible. The prosperity gospel is wrong. No, it's not the gospel that is wrong. There's nothing wrong with the gospel of prosperity. It is the gospel. God wants his people to prosper. He wants you to have life and to have it more abundantly. The problem comes when you, the recipient, have a crooked heart. When you have a heart that is unregenerated. When your mind has not aligned with the mind of Christ. Then you end up trying to grasp for these things with the wrong mind. And when you don't see, you begin to condemn it and you say, these people are charlatans. They're thieves. They're manipulators. No, it was you that had the wrong motive in the first place. And because you asked amiss, you could not receive of him. Why? Because James starts by giving the secret right there in the first chapter. He says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Such a man should not expect to receive anything of the Lord. Now, the thing is, when most people read this, they think of it in terms of doubt only. Because James first begins by talking about doubt. But you need to understand, he says, a double-minded man. Even though he mentioned doubt initially, now he is talking about double-mindedness. What does he mean by double-minded? Because having doubt is not being double-minded. No. Doubt can come. Fear can come. Doesn't mean you're double-minded. You still want it with all your mind. You're just afraid you might not get it. Double-mindedness, remember that the context we are in, in throughout scripture, is you have the mind of Christ and you have the mind of the world. So a double-minded person is a person whose mind has not been submitted to the mind of Christ. So even as they come, on one hand, there is the mind of the world that's filled with lasting after this and the other and the other. They still have this thing of, and people see me, and I show off, and I do this, and I go and live the life I want, and I go and I, I sustain myself, you know, and I go and, you know, excite my flesh and give myself everything I want. They're probably even, even as they are praying for these things, you can tell that should they get them, they're actually going to take them far from God. It has been amazing. I have known of believers who, when they got wealthy, the first thing that happened is they got a second wife. And you're thinking, what happened? I thought you were a believer. What happened? That's a double-minded man. The mind of the world is still warring with the mind of Christ in him. And so as a result, when these things come to him, we see him satisfying his lusts. Because his desires have not yet been aligned with the desires of Christ. That's why scripture is very clear. It says, delight yourself in the Lord. 
and then he will grant you the desires of your heart. You see, most people want to read only the latter part. God will grant me the desires of my heart. He begins by saying, delight yourself in the Lord. Why? When you delight yourself in the Lord, something happens to your desires. They change and they align with the desires of God. When you delight yourself in God, something happens to your ideas, to your plans. Your plans change and they align with the will of God for your life. When you delight yourself in the Lord, something happens to your motivations. The motivations for what you do change and they align with the motivations of God. And so what we are seeing is God is literally saying this. Delight yourself in me. Align your heart with mine. Align your desires with mine. Align your will with mine. Align your plans with mine. And because now they are aligned with mine, I can grant you each and every one of those desires. Because remember, we can pick and cherry pick the verses that tell us, ask anything that your joy may be complete. But the same Jesus who says that also in another part says, if you ask according to his will. No verse stands by itself. They work together. So it is ask anything, but ask anything according to his will. So it's not ask anything, therefore ask whatever hits your mind, whatever wild thing hits you. No, he says, ask anything according to his will. So you need to know his will first. You need to be aligned to his will first. You need to be aligned to his desires first. You need to be aligned to his plan for your life first. It says, delight yourself in the Lord. Why? Because when you delight yourself in the Lord, you come to the place where what makes him happy is what makes you happy. You come to the place where what delights him is what delights you. And he can then grant you all the desires of your heart because your desires are rightly aligned towards him. You can see this example in Solomon at the beginning of his reign. God comes to him with what I believe was a trick question. Because he tells him, Solomon, I'm very pleased with you. Ask anything. Now, some people immediately you think, oh, had I been in his position. And that's exactly why you would have failed. And probably the reason why God has not yet even come to you to tell you that. Because when Solomon answers, you see a young man who because of the teachings of his father, who incidentally is the one who wrote the delight yourself in the Lord and he will grant you the desires of your heart. Because of the teachings of his father, says, Look, you've given me such a great people to rule. Your people are such a great nation. So he aligns himself with the desires of God. He knows that the heart of God is about his people. He knows that God coming to him and telling him, ask anything, his heart and his motives and everything is still all about the well-being of all of his people. So he aligns himself with the heart of God and he says, your people are great people. It basically tells him the task I have before me is big. I need wisdom to do it right. He has aligned himself with God. And then here is what you see. God says, because you didn't ask for riches or long life, I will Give them to you. Now, do you see something very interesting? Because that means had he asked for riches or long life, God would have said, ah, you just don't get it yet. You'd probably have told him your selfishness. Because of your selfishness, you are not ready to receive. 
Now just get the context of it. See how he says, because you've not asked for these things, which means God came to him. And it was a test to see what will he ask for when given that kind of opportunity. What will he ask for when granted that opportunity? And Solomon passed the test. But I would ask you to question yourself, would you pass the test if it was you today? In fact, have you passed it? Because most of you have read those scriptures. Ask, you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened. But what have you asked for? What have you sought for? Which doors have you knocked on? Have you inadvertently been failing the test all along and falling in the category that James talks about? They ask amiss. Because it's interesting that the same scripture that tells you to ask and you shall receive, then later, the same scriptures then later tell you that it's possible to ask amiss. Yet when they were telling you to ask, they didn't give you any conditions. When Jesus was saying, ask that your joy may be complete, he doesn't tell you that there is a condition, ask according to his will. He says that in a different place. Why? Because you're supposed to know the whole counsel of God. So it is possible to actually miss what God is trying to say. Well, the lesson God is teaching you because you are focused on your lusts. You are focused. You are so hyper focused on the healing for my mother that you can't even see that yes, it is true without a doubt that God wants your mother healed. God wants your daughter healed. God wants your son healed. God wants your uncle healed. But he's saying, hey, hey, hey. I have a purpose beyond that. So Solomon passed the test. Will you pass it? Can you, I, I want to place a challenge before you, child of God, to tell you the truth. That no amount of applying the principles we shall be teaching sub subsequently will help you if you have not first taken time to align your heart with God. Now, I postulated before you and I said that the onus is on you. The onus is on you. He says, I wish above all things that you would. Basically that you would exercise your will towards this. So this is not something God is going to do for you. This is something you're going to work yourself to. You're going to will yourself to. You're going to will yourself to submit yourself to the will of God. You're going to will yourself to change your attitudes. You're going to will. You must exercise your will towards it. You must make a choice you must make a decision to be transformed. You must make a choice to be turned around, to think. You must make a deliberate choice and decision to say, I am aligning my thinking, I'm aligning my mind with the word of God, with the mind of God as revealed in his word. You must make a choice, you must make a decision. So I come to you, and I want to challenge you today, child of God. I want to challenge you today to have your whole mindset transformed when it comes to the area of prosperity. Number one, we began by showing that God's will is prosperity. So have your mind transformed to know that, first of all, it is his will. God is not the one withholding your prosperity. God is not the one withholding your health. No, it is his will that you prosper and be in health. But then he's telling you that 
It is my will. But you need to align with it. You need to position yourself with it. You need to put yourself where you need to be in order to receive it. Just like I often teach in Breakthrough and I tell people that fasting doesn't move God. It moves you. And positions you where you can receive what he has already made available by grace. So fasting is an act of faith. Because everything in salvation is about grace and faith working together. Grace, God acting on his own faith, you responding to what God has done. Even fasting is that way. Fasting is the faith response to God's grace that has provided. It's a faith response to position yourself. God provides, in fact, even the grace comes from God. He gives you a grace to fast, then you respond to that grace and you actually fast, and then you position yourself and you receive even more grace, the things he has released. In the same way, even when it comes to the things of prosperity, the same principle applies. The same principle applies. And that is, you must first of all be convinced. If you're one of those who over time, because of the abuses that you have seen, because of the extremes that you've had, you'd gotten to a place where you reject even hearing the word prosperity. There must be a mindset change in you. A mindset that says, I'm aligning myself to what the word says. And clearly the word talks about Zoe life, the God kind of life, a full life. I'm aligning myself to what the word says. And clearly the word says, God wants me to prosper and be in health. I'm aligning myself to what the word says. And the word clearly says, God, he delights in my prosperity because I'm among his people. I'm aligning myself with the word to realize that God says, the blessing it maketh rich and adds no sorrow. I'm aligning myself to it. But then you don't stop there because some people, that's all where they stop. They say, but I'm also going to align myself by making sure that my heart and my desire towards this prosperity is rightly aligned. I am not looking to satisfy my lusts. I am not looking to, uh, to please my flesh, my, gen my the, the desire, my understanding of what God wants for me now also translates into understanding why he wants it for me. So it's not enough just to know what God wants for you. You need to understand why he wants it for you. Why does God want you to prosper? Why does God want you to be in health? Because it is not enough. I mean, it, it, it's been amazing. We've seen some strange things in the, in the course of ministry over the years. I know someone who after prayer and they received healing from HIV, they went on a spree of sleeping around. It's like they had been burning all this time, but what had been holding them back was the HIV in them. When they got a miracle, instead of it leading them to more, to, to, to more righteousness, it instead led them to destruction. Sometimes that's exactly how we are. God looks at you and says, that one, the day I grant them that money, they are going to, to begin to despise everyone who has less than them. They're going to begin to speak boastfully. They're going to begin to, to act high and mighty. There are some people we knew. When, when they got cars, they stopped coming to overnight to pray. Because clearly the cars is what had brought them. There are those we knew. You know, they would pray all night until they got a car. Now they would leave at two. So we knew that what used to keep them around was because they had no way of going home at two. What is your motivation? What drives you? What drives you? Why do you want to prosper? Why? What drives you? There's some, and so there is a challenge to you today. There is a challenge to us today that I'm 
posing to each of us. Can you examine your heart? Can you examine your heart? Because when your motives are not aligned right, no matter how much you try to work the principles, they're not going to work for you. And for those others, if you've not yet been convinced that it is God's will, because when you look at what James teaches, you can see that he deals with two things. He's dealing with these same two issues. He talks about the fact that, but they must ask without doubting. So there are those of you who you're not yet even convinced that God wants you to prosper. So even when you're asking, you're asking with hesitancy. You're asking with an if. If you want me to be healed. If you want me to prosper. And so you can't because there's an if. You've not yet come to that place where you ask with assurance because you know that's what he wants for you. Remember he said, if you ask according to his will, when you're not yet convinced it is his will, you can't even ask with confidence. And then, of course, we talked about what happens next. He talked about the double-minded man. The others are on the other side of the equation. Perhaps they've gotten convinced that it is his will. But the problem now is their mind. The mind, their mind is still struggling. They are still milk believers. They are still struggling with discerning good and evil. They are still struggling with repentance from dead works. They are struggling with dead works. They are thinking, oh, I will drive this car and everyone will give glory to God when they know that's not how it works. And in their head and in their heart, they know that's truly not the point. I want everyone to just see me. So there's still an issue in them. There's still two minds that work within them, and they too cannot receive from the Lord. Because there's two minds operating in them. James keeps dealing with this. In fact, the, when you look at the epistle of James, he's dealing with these dualities. See how he breaks down. In fact, everything he deals with, he deals with dualities. He deals with someone who is asking, but they have doubt. Then he deals with someone who is asking, but they have two minds on how they are going to use these things. Then again, he comes back and he's talking about asking again. And then he deals with another duality. He deals with those who are not asking. Then he deals with those who are asking, but asking with the wrong motives. Then he deals with faith and works. And he deals with those who have faith, who say they have faith, but they have no works. And then he's talking about those, of course, with works and no faith. He's, he keeps dealing with dualities. He's dealing with the extremes that many believers today are struggling with. Because of hearing lopsided messages. Because of hearing incomplete messages. Even when we begin to deal with the actual principles, there's going to be a lot we are going to deal with beyond that. Because, for example, you're going to discover some interesting things. Most of the time, we tell people a lot about sowing the seed, but rarely tell them enough about nurturing it, about how to grow it, about how to water it, about how to fertilize it, about how to, when it has grown and it's full, about how to bring in the harvest. And so you have a people, the, the people I know who have been sowing, 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 sowing. And they are wondering why they don't see any harvest. Because nobody told them how the harvest is brought in. Nobody even told them how their seed is watered. They have an incomplete picture. They are like farmers going around in every field scattering seed and never coming back. Because no one has told them what happens beyond that. And I want you to understand one thing, that when we begin to talk about prosperity, when we begin to talk about the Zoe life, prosperity, health, and soul prosperity, the Zoe life, we're not just going to be talking about sowing. Uh -uh. 
There's so much more to it than that. The, it's, it goes so far beyond that. No. There's going to be a challenge to us to become full-grown believers. We are called to be full-grown. That's why all these things exist. In fact, that's why we teach like the way we do, so that you may grow to the fullness of the stature of life. Christ lived the Zoe life. He lived the God kind of life. No wonder he used to tell them, have the God kind of faith. Have the God kind of faith. Because he lived the God kind of life. And the God kind of life is lived by faith. The just shall live by faith. He came and demonstrated to us what the God kind of life looks like. You see, the impressive thing about Christ is this. He did not amass riches, yet he never lacked. When he needed to pay taxes, the money was available. There was money in his treasury because Judas had money to steal. Scripture tells us he used to steal. So there must have been something for him to steal. Without a doubt. And we know that there were people who supplied his needs. The Bible talks about those women in Luke chapter 8. It says these women, they supplied all of his needs and those of his disciples. But Jesus showed us what this life looks like. Because when you read you find that his robe was not cheap. That's why the soldiers were fighting over it at the cross. He was not wearing a cheap robe. In fact, this, I was reading one particular version actually puts it right like that. It says, they said they could not separate it because the robe was of high quality. Instead, they cast lots for it. So that tells us something, you know, because sometimes when we talk about Jesus and the life he lived here, we make it look like he lived a life of poverty. No. When the scripture says that he became poor, that we may be rich, there is, first of all, we need to understand that no matter what kind of life Christ could have lived on earth here, it would still have seemed like poverty compared to where he came from. So, given the kind of glory he laid aside the kind of power and majesty that he laid aside. It, no matter even if he had become the Roman emperor, it would have been absolute poverty compared to where he came from. Because he laid aside immensity of glory. You know, it says according to the riches of his glory. I mean, he laid aside what we can't even comprehend today here on earth to come to this poor existence, so to speak. So, even when he tells us that we may be, meaning that we can also rise and transcend to that level, that tells you that the Zoe kind of life most definitely goes beyond what you would have here in the world because it would still be poverty. Even if you had Bill Gates money, it's still poverty. By heavenly standards. Even if you had, I don't know who is the richest man these days, Jeff Bezos, money, it would still be poverty by heavenly standards because the heavenly standard is far more than shares, and your net worth. God wants you to have a full life. Fullness. He's talking about health. He's talking about supply. But he's talking about even the, what we would call intangibles. Peace beyond understanding. Not as the world gives it. Joy like a fountain. The joy of the Lord being your strength. So you're constantly strong because you're overflowing in joy. You are constantly in hope, even as you live a life of faith, hope in believing. You, he's talking about that kind of fullness. There's a sense of satisfaction because you know I am walking right in the will of God. Hallelujah. What a challenge. 
What a challenge for us today. I don't want to delve so much more into this because there's so much that you need to chew on just from this. Some of you may be thinking, I've had this stuff before. You may have, but you need to go back and chew on this. Chew on it more because it sets the stage for everything that's coming as we continue into this. I am going at a snail's pace when it comes to this because it's important that you don't miss the foundational things, that you don't miss that which sets the foundation on which you will build the house. Because if the foundation be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? If the foundation is crooked, the house is crooked. If the foundation is cracked, it doesn't matter how good what is built on top of it is. It can't stand. So we must lay the right foundation when it comes to understanding what the God kind of life is. When it comes to understanding what true prosperity is. When it comes to understanding what the state on, of our hearts and of our minds should be. In order to prosper the God kind of way. I'm glad you've tuned in. I'm delighted that you have tuned in and I know God is going to do a great thing with you. Thank you for tuning in. And I pray that you be, your, your mind will be transformed into the mind of Christ. I ask that in your prayer time, you keep asking God to grant you, to grant you wisdom, to grant you understanding, to transform your mind. Ask him and say, Lord, show me, shine your light in me. Shine your light deep in me. I like to look. I love Psalm 139 verse 23. He says, search me, O Lord. See if there be any way in me that does not please you and lead me in the way everlasting. That's important. Ask him to search you, to show you those things that, are, that put you out of alignment with him, that put you out of alignment with his will and with his purpose for you. Ask him to search you and to shine his light in those areas that perhaps you've ignored, you've even forgotten. But as he shines his light on these things, on certain attitudes you have, on certain mindsets you have, certain lusts you have, certain passions that are not of him, certain ambitions that are not of him, that as he shines his light like this, there will be a realignment in you, a change in you as you see these things, acknowledge them, confess them, and repent of them. Remember, repenting is changing your mind. So as you see, as you are shown, as the light shines and shows you, you make a deliberate choice to change your mind about these things. I pray that that will be what the choice and the decision you make. That you make the choice and the decision today to say, I want the God kind of life. Remember we said, you must make a choice. You must exercise your will. And I'll, I'll delve a bit more into that next time. Because there's more to it. There's far more to it. Because if our prosperity is an issue of our will, why aren't some prospering? Yet they seem to be very willing to prosper. Those are questions we have to ask ourselves. But we will delve a bit more into these things. Because some people may say, are you blaming me for where I am today? No, I'm not. Are you saying I'm the cause for my own? No, I'm, that's not what I am saying. But I'm saying there's something you may not know. It's always about knowledge. That's why he says, my people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. Notice he says, my people. He doesn't say, it's not, he's not talking about the world. He's talking about you and me says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So most of the time, all the time, the situations we are in, 
because there is something we don't know. And we cannot act on what we don't know. What the word comes to do is to bring that knowledge to us, to enlighten us, to bring that life to us. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in. Until the next time, God bless you. Amen.